So with so much in the news about uh, facial recognition, uh, we have uh, headlines every single day of new reports of how facial recognition is being used. Uh, we have the they want to make us uh, believe that uh, the facial recognition for all the students at the schools. Well, this last headline was in China, but was a good thing because it's for the children's safety. We have uh, we have a, a lady in um, Pennsylvania that had her uh, picture used uh, to promote a dating site, and she doesn't even know where the photo came from. And that lawsuit is uh, still pending against uh, Facebook and Reddit. And we have uh, we did a story not long ago here on uh, Chewing the Fat about a, an officer that uh, ended up uh, seeing his face used as a, uh, a promo picture uh, for a dating website. And he's trying to convince the wife that I didn't have anything to do with it. It's not me. And... Uh, Oh, you know what? Yeah, you know what? I did go there for just a, by accident, but they're using his picture uh, for more than just that. And so, I wanted to get uh, a professional in here, someone who actually uh, went to school, uh, unlike me, uh, and decided to actually get a law degree. Uh, Austin Pennington, a trial attorney here in Dallas. Austin, thanks for joining us today. Jeff, thanks for having me on. Happy to be here. Absolutely, it's good to have you. Now, before we get into all the facial recognition, which is what I tease. Now, since you're in Dallas. Uh, one of the things that um, I know, I, as we were talking before uh, the interview started, we talked, uh, got into some really fascinating stuff about the facial recognition, which we'll get into. But <clears> since <throat> you're in Dallas, the Amber Geiger trial. Yes. How much of attention did you pay to that? Uh, probably not as much as I wanted to. Had a couple a busy few weeks, but I realized you had your own cases to worry about. But it was it was a very interesting trial. It was interesting for a number of reasons for me. Uh, and if I can go into it, I mean, yeah. the, the fact that she was charged with murder, I thought was interesting at first because I thought this looked like a quintessential manslaughter case. You had a mistake made. The mistake of fact defense was going to be her mainstay defense. Yeah. And so first off, I was surprised they charged her of that. More importantly, I was surprised she was convicted. Of right. That. And, and then after being convicted of that, I was surprised that the jury only gave her 10 years. And, and the reason that surprises me is because. And so I've historically I've practiced a lot of criminal defense and, and never handled a mur- handled, handled a murder trial. But typically, if you've got a case that you feel is very strong, so for example, in this one, I thought murder was going to be a hard one for the yeah. state to prove. So I thought manslaughter, you know, that's going to be what they get. And the fact that the state convinced the jury to convict her of murder, if I'm the defense lawyer, I'm thinking, well, I don't want that jury sentencing my client because you get the choice. You get to pick judge or jury on that. And so I was surprised they went with the they jury just went with it all. Yeah. And then the jury only gave her 10 years. So I, it, it's an interesting outcome. You know, we, we have this saying in our profession, you never know what a jury's going to do. And, and this is a prime example of how that happens. Now we have uh, now after the case, we have them, uh, you know, go, going after the judge for uh, giving Amber the Bible. And uh, you ever see anything like that in your days in court? I mean, I thought I I didn't think it was that big a deal. I didn't think it was that big of a deal either. And I think you know the judge has a lot of of leniency or or, or freedom to kind of do what you know she wants in her courtroom. It was after the trial. It was after the trial. I, I didn't think there was a problem with that. I didn't think there was a problem with how the judge allowed the victim's brother to give Amber a hug I and mean, come down. That off guy, the stand. whether whether he wants to admit it or not. Uh, uh, John's brother uh, is a hero. I agree. Wholeheartedly. Oh, that guy is a hero. Hero. He, he said a lot of brave things on the stand. It was one of the most gracious and loving displays uh, of courage that, that I've ever seen. I mean, we all career. want to wish that we could get there. Absolutely. And think that we could be there. I don't know that I could. It'd be. I think we'd all be lying if we could. Just, if we just spot on said yes, we could. And so there's just a, a massive amount of forgiveness that came from that man. No kidding. And I, I honestly believe he saved Dallas from riots. That's. I've had a few conversations with friends and colleagues, and, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. I Jeff. think. I think he saved Dallas. Hundred percent. I mean, no question. All right, let's get to talking about. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, I, we could keep talking about no, Amber could. if you want. No we problem. We could. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I. I've, there's. So many things that happened in that trial, I'm amazed at. But uh, let's move to facial recognition. Definitely. For the reason I actually have you here. <laughs> uh, so we have, uh, I've found these these cases are kind of the same, but they're different. <clears throat> right? I mean, you're trying to say that really they're all under the First Amendment umbrella. 
Right. Well, there's, there's a couple different angles you can go with facial recognition issues. You know, the, the, the First Amendment issue is one of the big ones that you and I were discussing earlier. Right. And then you get, a, get into a whole bunch of privacy issues that are independent okay. of the First Amendment that deal with, you know, employees, employers, uh, things in the public nature, things in the public forum. And so those kind of, to me, those are the two on the civil side, the two areas that you see. Okay, so the lady in Pennsylvania, I think, that uh, had her face uh, that, that's suing. Uh, I mean, she's suing Facebook and Reddit and some others are right. on the case, too, for $10 million. I mean, good luck uh, right. you know, being able to prove it. But she had uh, her face or her copy of her likeness was used to promote dating websites and pornography sites and erectile dysfunction ads. Right. And she claims that the picture <clears throat> was taken from a store security right. camera. Well. I mean, we're pretty much all being filmed and photographed everywhere we go today unless you don't have a camera in your own home. And then right. we've got to worry about a drone flying by and looking <laughs> in my window. Right. Uh, if you're not doing anything wrong, what do you got to worry about? But uh, Classic government advice there. Perfect. Right. Uh, now, if she walked into that store and as she walked into that store, there's a sign there that says, you know, you're being filmed and you're on camera. And then the store owner sells those pictures just like uh, Sprint or Facebook or AT&T or Verizon because we all sign away our rights with our pictures. I right. know everybody thinks that, uh, you know, your, your Facebook picture with, uh, your, uh, with your kid and, your, and grandma is yours, but you signed that away the minute you signed up for Facebook. I mean, that's their photo, right? Right. I mean, Technically. technically right to a, to to a certain extent yes oh what is that extent then <laughs> well so so there's multi layers to this so i kind of want to backtrack a little bit and get into it first you know, she's suing facebook okay. and reddit right. so to to your point right there that's the wrong person to be filing the lawsuit against in this in this situation the reason she's filing the lawsuit against them they have the pockets they're easier to find maybe maybe you know wrangle some money out of them at the beginning Facebook and Reddit are they're creating a conduit through which a third party is advertising on their site. Right. Well, they're just creating the the space. They're not the one that's actually putting together the ad. They don't have any any say so on what the ad looks like or says other <sighs> than than there's certain parameters, but they're not the ones that are that are necessarily promoting a product. They're just providing a, a space to do it in. Right. So that's kind of the first thing that Facebook and Reddit there's no real liability there for what they're they're putting out there. There's, they're still responsible for what goes into that space, though. They are. They are. And they can't post any illegal content or any kind of anything that's going to create what we call hate speech or, or things of that nature that's going to incite crime. That's one of the First Amendment restrictions you have there. But really, the the ad promoter, the company that's promoting the dating website or promoting whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Company. Yeah, you know, the, the, the strip club that puts her on the, on the poster. Right. Those are the, the quote-unquote wrongdoers that, that she should be going after if... You know, let's, that's assuming she has a viable cause of action. And they don't have any money anyway, so why go after them? Right, right. And when it's hard to find them, they don't have insurance <laughs> policies and you know all that kind of stuff. You know, you know, it's funny. Actually, one of the first cases I ever had in my career, and, and I say case, it was a really short deal, but had a, uh, a friend of a friend. <clears throat> she was a waitress. The uh, company had a common owner, the, or the, the owner of the restaurant was also an owner of a strip club. And he had taken a picture of her and slapped it all over these flyers that went up on Facebook and social media and all these kinds of things. And so a very similar situation. Now, we never got to the point of filing a lawsuit. Really? We just sent a demand letter. They took it down, and everything was fine. And usually, a, a lot of times with those things, you, they, you, know, you get the cease and desist, and you go, oh, okay, sorry. Right. Hey, sorry. Yeah. Didn't mean it. My bad. Didn't, didn't understand. Right. Didn't know. And that's, you know, that's what happened with our situation. Um, going to your point about the ownership and, and the fact yeah. that she walks into the store – the difference is with the cell phone companies and with everything else that you sign off on, you're waiving your rights or you're you're admitting or acknowledging that you know that if you have a picture of yourself, that can be used for me or marketing purposes and other things like that. The difference is when she walked into that convenience store, she didn't sign any kind of waiver or or permission to use any kind of security footage of her to be used elsewhere. So there is a distinction there. Whether or not she can put together a cause of action is a different question, but right. th I do want to point that out. That there even, is a and, I, and I understand, but even if uh, there was, uh, you know, his argument would be, well, I've got a sign right there on the front door. She can't, you can't come into the store without seeing the sign that you're going to be on camera. Right. 
Right. Now, the difference is if he's selling that, you know, knowing that you're going to be on camera versus knowing that you're going to use my likeness and picture to make money are two different things. Because that's, yeah. what, that's what typically, you know, I'll just think of one of the things that comes to, to mind. You go to an apartment complex, you sign a lease, and they say, hey, if we take a picture of you, you understand that we may use this in our promotional materials and other things like that. Right. That we're obviously using to market for people to come sign leases. That's different than a sign on the front door of a uh, convenience store that says you are on camera. Because really the purpose of that is to notify everybody look, if you steal something, I might see you, and there could be criminal prosecution right. from there. Right. So, uh, now, the uh, the guy that, uh, you know, can, trying to convince his wife, I mean, that again, that goes back to you, he signed it away when he signed up for, you know, his... I was just looking at right. the dating site, honey. Really, I, I loved you, baby. No, right. I had nothing to do with it. I just happened to be there. But now they're using, you know, the picture was like, we love it, and you signed up, and we can use it for anything we want. How do you put a stop to that? I'm gonna be to be frank with you. I don't know because quite quite honestly, there's we were just talking about the fact that you sign away some of your rights. Yeah. Well, there's a limit somewhere. We haven't really tested that, those boundaries yet, and that's kind of the the crazy thing about law is that it stays gray area until finally we see enough situations to make it black and white. So right now, especially with the dissemination of information on the internet, social media, and how marketing is going through social media platforms. I think that we're going to see a lot more of these situations come up, and maybe at some point we finally, a court will say, all right, here's the boundary. You know, we don't have any laws out there right now, definitely, that, that say the boundary is here, but we're going to need some more test cases to figure that out. And where do you think those boundaries are going to be? I mean, there's, that's, a, that's a wide swath right, it is. of uh, what can and can't happen with... Uh, you know, I say, uh, sure, uh, I, I want to be able to take a picture on my phone. So, yes, you can have the pictures. I just want to take the picture on my phone. Right. right. But really, I'm not. Here's, I mean, this is this is my fight to that. Is really, I'm not giving you the right to use my picture. Right. But I know that I'm saying yes to your app because I just want to take the picture. I just want right. to take the picture of the stupid pumpkin that my kid carved. Right. You know right. what I mean? Well, and kind of what you're getting at, Jeff, they, I mean, we're talking about consumer protection laws. I mean, that's the FTC is going to have to get involved and start looking at how do we protect consumers so that they know what they're signing, what they're actually waving and giving away. And so on a, on a very small scale, what, what we'll start to see is some beefed up language in some of these, these waivers and these acknowledgments and, and these... Um, you know, assignments of rights that will fully explain everything. Does that solve the problem? No, because you, no, you're not because getting on and reading they the still, fine print. I mean, I, I believe that most of the time uh, using, you know, the picture app as a, a as a, a, an explanation. Right. Um, uh, as an example, the uh, I know. I know what you said. I, I know that. I know you said yes. I can use. You might sell it, and it might be a third-party app, and it might go to, uh, you know, Bill's Clubhouse, and he might like it and use your picture. But really, again, I just, I just want to take the picture. I right. said yes. I just right. I well, know what it meant. Yeah, and, and I think an avenue that we can look to to kind of create an analogy here is you've got many lawsuits that come out when someone or when a company uses a celebrity's what we call likeness yeah. for profit. So Ariana Grande had something come out a few months ago uh, about that. She had sued. Uh, I, I don't remember what store it was, but she had sued a store for using a likeness of her in a commercial after she said she wouldn't participate in the commercial. It wasn't her. It was someone who right. danced like her. It was music that sounded like her. And they're still litigating that out right now. But obviously with a celebrity, you've got a compensable amount of damages. You can say, look, I'm worth this much. You you, you profited this much from using sure. my, my picture. And yes, that wasn't me, but everyone thought it was. Exactly. And so that you know, you can you can quantify that. Well problem is someone like, you know, you or me uh, they use our likeness. I mean, we're not up there on stage. No one's really paying to come see us perform or anything like uh, I that. Mean, I mean, I hate to disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> hey, and but, you know uh, what? I probably shouldn't have looped you in on that. I probably okay, should have just included you. myself uh, on that I one mean, there. <laughs> hello. <laughs> I mean, I'm on Jim's uh, websites all over America. There you go. <laughs> there you go. But see, you, I mean, but you can understand the problem. You know, I can't. I, thank, I can't you. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I can't quantify <laughs> with with what what you know what I'm worth because you've used my likeness. So when we have a situation like that, what the 
regulation regulators, excuse me, have done historically is they say they create statutory penalties. They say, okay, look, if you use John Doe's picture, cell phone user, Facebook user, whatever, you put it on this site, he files a claim, and you've used it to try and make money in some way, shape, or form, there's a set flat penalty for how many times you've used it, how you've used it, and they can put, obviously, different gradations in there. Sure. But that's a deterrent, because really, educating the consumer sounds great. You, you know, you've, I mean, uh, utopian-wise, it would be great to be able to do that. Right. It doesn't work that well, quite honestly. Deterrence on the big boys, that's where you start to see some reform, because if they know, okay, I am exposing myself... Even if it's small penalties, you rack up enough of that stuff, it gets pretty expensive yeah, and it's it bad PR. And, and so that's really, I could see that happening. I haven't heard anything that's going down that direction. But if you look at how things have done, been done in the past with, and I know this really doesn't sound like it has anything to do with facial recognition, but like the Fair Debt Collection Act, for example, you get debt collectors who call and harass and annoy and-, and Oh man, do people. I hate those. Well, so what, what the what the FTC or what the the government did was they said, okay, we can educate the consumer on what their rights are. That's not really helping. Well, guess what? Now we put these penalties in place that for every call you make that violates, you get slapped with a ten thousand dollar penalty. So you make sixteen calls, sixteen grand, boom. That's been a deterrent. There's been a huge reform in how debt collecting agencies have to actually jump through hoops now. Again, two totally different areas, but it's a situation where you've got a deterrent that actually created some change for a consumer issue. Right. The, the, there was some sort of line drawn <clears throat> right. uh, to help the consumer right. out. And so it made a difference. Where, uh, I mean, I could just pay the bill. Yes. I could just pay the bill rather than worry about the debt collector calling. <laughs> right. But why do that? That's right. just dumb. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other whole other topic for a whole other day there, Jeff. <laughs> uh, all right. So then now we, we, and, and we go into uh, facial recognition for... Law enforcement. Yes. Uh, cities uh, have been trying to implement it uh, across. I mean, we're pretty good at it now. Uh, you know, 20 years ago was, you know, a slow process, but I mean, they, that's evolved. Right. We have some municipalities saying, no, uh, right. we don't want any facial recognitions. Others are saying, yeah, bring it. We want the safety. I mean, performers are using it to uh, try to keep themselves safe from. Mm particular stalkers or whatever right. so if you're you know if you're someone that's bad and they have your picture they can put it out there and if the computer finds you in the concert you're done right right <clears throat> um but for sure law enforcement is uh you know monitoring on the streets which gets me back to just being filmed right where's where is that line for that where are we at with that well and it's always going to be a sliding scale of right to privacy versus safety of our of our citizens and you know, we have the Fourth Amendment there about illegal search and seizure. That always has to do <laughs> you with... You keep bringing up the Constitution. I do. I do. You know, it still exists. It still exists, <laughs> despite some people's viewpoint and some people's perceptions. It is still there. And I could give a whole talk about how no refusal weekend is a, is a sham because you can't circumvent the Constitution. But, huh. you know, we may not have time for that today. But going back to what you're saying, you're walking down the street in a public place. You have a certain expectation of privacy but it's much lower than what you would have if you're in your home. When I say expectation of privacy, you have the right to know that as I'm walking down the street, an officer is not allowed to just come up and empty my pockets and see what I have in there. At the same time, someone is allowed to see that I am on the street because I am there in a public place right. walking around. So let's kind of go down this hypothetical okay. you were talking about. You're walking down, it's a strip, strip mall, or just, let's call it a big mall, an actual Whatever. indoor mall, got security cameras everywhere. And the security cameras are watching, watching, watching. They've got facial recognition. Boom, they hit this. They automatically run a warrant search, see that you've got a warrant out for your arrest. Well, and again, this hasn't been tested yet, but my opinion, at that point, you're in a public place, and they've scanned you, and you have a warrant out for your arrest. Well, the warrant's public knowledge, and whether or not, you know, you don't have an expectation of privacy to not be arrested at that point. You have a warrant that's already really? been issued by a judge that's already said that there's probable cause that you committed some crime. I didn't even know that warrant was out for me. Right. And, and a lot of times you don't. And there's a lot of people that get pulled over and their driver's license gets ran. Now, the difference there, they committed a traffic violation. So that's there's a little bit more of a prompt. Well, they may have committed Allegedly. a traffic Thank violation. You, Jeff. Thank you very much. <laughs> keep me honest over here. They Keep me honest. But, but with the walking through the mall... You don't have an expectation of privacy of the people around you knowing where you are because you're walking out in public. 
And right. so I don't have an issue with that because at that point you're searching through and you're finding someone has an outstanding warrant. Now, facial recognition, say that let's throw the warrant idea out of there and same person walking through the mall. I, I guess I struggle to see how facial recognition from a law enforcement perspective can do anything other than search for people who have outstanding warrants or have certain things that law enforcement is already looking for. And then the facial recognition helps them find where they are, where they're located at. Well, what they what will happen is then, and then if they're recording, just stick on that. And I want to I want to go back to mm-hmm. uh, uh, the facial recognition to the warrants too. Yes. But uh, if you're out going through this mall and the mall is filming, they could. I mean, it would take. I mean, it's going to take a huge database. But eventually, you're going to have this database of all these faces, right? Right. To search through. Which hopefully then you have, and I say hopefully on the police side, uh, you know, then you're able to go through that database. Uh, if if a year from now I commit a crime, right, <clears throat> and they're trying to see follow my trail, mm-hmm. then they're able to go back and uh, follow my trail and document it that way, right? But I don't know what good that would do now that I talk about it out loud. Well, there's actually a similar concept they use with cell phone towers to do the same thing. And so you can, based on your cell phone, sends out a signal right. to different GPS right, towers right, right, right. around. And, and historically, they've used that to triangulate sure. where is this where person were, located at. at yeah. And that's been tested by the Supreme Court, and there's been kind of ebbs and flows on how that's allowed to happen. Uh, most, and now it requires a search warrant to go and get that information because you're searching the cell phone technically. Oh. But the information of it, the the phone sending that out to the tower, that's that's not private information. That's your, your the cell phone carrier sees that, so there's a third person involved, and so it's different than like a uh, a text message that I send from myself to you that's got more of a private side to it because the cell phone carrier can't get in there and see that. And so huh, I'm making that, that analogy. Admit. Awesome. I well, don't know. It's simply- the court said, the court say, <laughs> but that's kind of the analogy I would think of with your hypothetical there is, okay, you've been in a public place. The camera obviously is controlled by a third party, you know, yeah. or you should be able to assume that you're being filmed if you're in a shopping yeah. mall. And so that's not really private knowledge that's, that is protected by the fourth amendment. And so for, for law enforcement to use that later down the road, it's really, it's an investigative tool that in my opinion, doesn't really overreach on the fourth amendment wow are you working for the police now see i'm not that's Austin the thing is Pennington, i'm the <laughs> trial attorney from dallas <laughs> the funny thing is you talk to most of my friends and colleagues i'm about as left as they come when it comes to individual <laughs> rights and defending that kind of deal so but really when we're at, look in, in in today's world right i know that you know in today's world uh you're pretty much on camera wherever you go you are I mean, I, I, we've all pretty much given into that. Right. Right. I mean, we really have. I mean, I know it's easy to say that, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, I have that uh, expectation of privacy. Right. But no, you don't. <laughs> Shut up. You don't. Now, you can expect it all you want. You ain't getting it. <laughs> that's, that's probably, there's probably more truth to, to that than I'd be willing to admit I know, or, or I know. you know, acknowledge. So, uh, you know, at, at some point, um, I mean that's that's where we're at with the with the facial recognition, right. right? If I'm walking through the mall and they start sna- and they're snapping pictures so that they create that database, and then that database is sold outside of you know Joe's mall, right? Now we're you know we're making the, the that picture even bigger. We are. Right? I mean that, we are. The world gets a lot bigger. Yeah. That. Yeah, and we're moving out of the criminal realm at that point. You know, if you're selling that, it's kind of like selling data. Yeah. You know, we see that all the time, like these these line bikes and things around Dallas. That I mean, they're gathering data, they're selling it, and yeah. then it's being used to market and do all those kinds of things. Um, they, obviously, with the line bikes, people are voluntarily giving that data up. They may not know. know. They don't know where it's going, but they are. I mean, that's the distinction. They're I know. Voluntarily I know. giving it. You know, you don't have to get on the scooter and just ride down the road. I just want to ride the scooter. <laughs> I just, yes, I just wanted to take say. the picture. Yeah. That's yeah. all. <laughs> I just wanted to take the picture. Right. That's why I said yes. Right, right. And, and we kind of get back into this circular thing of, okay, well, the consumer needs to be educated. And they are. And and, and, and their fight, their argument is, look, you don't use the app. Right. right? You, we gave you the option, don't yep. use the app. Okay. Right. I, I, but how yeah. are you going to connect with everybody if you're not using the app? I know. I, I know you don't want me to use the app, but <clears throat> I just want to take the picture. Right. Then I don't have the picture of my kid's stupid pumpkin. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> see, and that means you can see how, how this it creates a little bit of a circular situation, yeah. and it's a lot of gray area, and that's why – that's why the laws have to adapt over time because we see different things happening and, and different fact situations. Okay, so just themselves. between you and me. <laughs> no one else listens. Just between yeah. you and me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who can we go after for $100 million right now? <laughs> In a situation like this? Just, we'll, we'll find it. We'll pick something out. <laughs> well, I will tell you the opioid epidemic is something that's been making a lot of headway in, in the news here in the yeah, last two months. Yeah, I've actually been following that pretty closely. But have you? You just, you just want to go off anything. Okay, that's, so all right, let's talk a little bit about <laughs> okay, that. Right. Okay. Uh, how is that the physician's fault? So they're not going okay. after the physicians. I know. They're going after the pharmaceutical so how is it not companies the, not the physicians and the fault. pharmacies. Right. And, uh, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, the physicians next. Yes. I mean, which is agonizing. They are going after the physicians who are supposed to be, you know, the the just nothing but the pill doctors, right. the pill right. pushers. I, I right. understand that. But, uh, you know, now and we've reached a point now where <clears throat> anyone who is in real pain and can, I don't know if you know this but the medicine actually works it does and yeah. it provides a service right uh, those people are treated like criminals now as well uh, they I mean, are we've gotta, gotta bring that back a little bit. so yeah again it's a pendulum thing as, as all things in law are and some of the, the discussions I've had about the opioid situation the reason we're seeing the pharma companies get sued first there's it's, it's a couple different levels of that hate the rich that's it that's it. You got the biggest pockets. And look, I hate to break it to you. I think that the, the law is a noble practice, but if you look around to who gets sued and who doesn't, it's who's got the deeper pockets. I mean, that's what it boils down to. I have no problem admitting that. That's that's just that's what it is. I mean, and that's the I mean, uh, just pause for a moment. I yeah. mean, we've talked a lot on this show about and we've joked around about it, but it's really true on um, the class actions. Yep. Uh, you know, the class action. They've got four hundred million dollars and I got a check for a dollar eighty five. Right, but, but the lawyer uh, got a check for twenty right. million. But, yeah. but your people, <laughs> right? Your people did okay. Right, right. <laughs> now, on the noble side of things, we're here to ferry out justice, and we wouldn't be able to protect people's rights if we didn't have lawyers. Oh, shut up! But hey, you know I'm going to defend. Just, just, you know, I know, I know, I'm just I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's all in good fun. Uh, but but you are, you're yes. abs- absolutely. You are. And 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 the thing is, though, is that. We're motivated, just like any other business owner, to go yeah. after the deep pockets. And so that's, that's America. That's the number one. Exactly. Capitalism. And that's the number one reason the big pharma companies are the ones that are getting sued. Now, digging into the legal side of that, the actual what does the law yeah. say about it? The Oklahoma judge that levied the five hundred and seventy two million dollar penalty yeah. against Johnson and Johnson. What he said, I think, is is really the main reason we're seeing these pharma companies continue to take shells and start to settle things out because they see the writing on the wall. And this is the reason the physicians are not being pulled in just yet. The marketing side of these pharma companies is what the judge found especially deplorable. So one of the main quotes right. that I keep, I keep slinging out there is that a lot of these sales reps were coached yeah. to say, listen, physician, it, only 2.6% of patients actually become addicted to these pills if prescribed by a physician. And they, they knew that was a they lie that was they a said lie. it. They knew that was a lie. Now, there is a s- systematic problem in the way that these pharma companies were coming in and marketing to these physicians. But they do that with every, they with do it with every medicine that the pharmacy uh, pharmaceutical company reps out. Right? They do. I mean, that's what they do. They do. And so that's part of the problem. The other problem is the actual procedure itself. And so I have many friends and colleagues that are in the medical sales business, whether they're doing lab brokerage services or they're helping physicians run their practices. What happens is these doctors, they've got a full day full of yeah, appointments. Really they've bad. got 10 minutes to talk to this pharmacy rep. If that. If that. And they come in, the pharmacy rep, they've got a relationship with them. They're friends. They trust them. The pharmacy rep is given the information, and then, boom, they feed it, feed it to them. Here's some samples. Here's some samples. Boom, exactly. Here's some samples. Give these out. And so the doctor's not really, and, and I'm not criticizing the doctor. I'm criticizing the system and the, and the process. The problem is the doctor's not fully getting all the information, all the scientific studies, and not looking I mean, he, into all the He details. just wants to take the picture. Right. He wants to take the picture. He just wants to take the picture. 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 Right. I mean, he's just, yeah, I know there's a problem. And that's, I just want to do this. And and there's, and there's a lot of people that are saying, well, these doctors, they're smart. They go to med school. And yes, they are. But if you had five minutes to talk about something that's being, or to hear about something that's being widely used and being promoted by and used by a lot of your your colleagues, are you really going to question it? You know? And, And so there's no need. There's no need. Right. And so that's one of the things the judge pointed out is that these, these pharmacy reps are pumping this, this lie basically about the, the, how these things can become addictive. Uh, second to that, the reason this is blown up even more is that so many of the patients who were using 
legal, prescribed Correct. narcotics, stopped getting them, and then all of a sudden we've seen a huge methamphetamine. I understand and meth and, and, and fentanyl and heroin. And I understand that, but that I find I'm hard pressed to blame that on the. Well, and I'm not blaming. I'm not blaming. I'm not blaming that on the pharmaceutical companies. I'm saying that's part of the reason this issue has blown up so much and gotten so much attention. Is is because of the kind of the waterfall effect of it. And that waterfall effect is, uh, you know, it's horrible. It is right. I mean, we've we've opened the floodgates to any kind of uh, to the to the cartels and to uh, you know the drug, the the big time drug push for the illegal drugs. There's big money in that. Yes, but I'm really. It's very. I just have I just have such a hard time with thinking that it's their fault. Although you kind of convinced me on the on, on the, uh, <laughs> on the sales in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, again. That's I think that's in my opinion. Reading the opinion by the judge in Oklahoma, who's who's the only one who's written an opinion on this so far. I believe that's one of the main reasons because he emphasized it so much that he slapped them with that penalty is because it was a deliberate choice by Johnson and Johnson to market it that which way, which makes it. Pretty plausible why the uh, the other companies want to settle. Exactly because they were all sending their reps out doing the same thing. They were, they were, and a lot of them made more money than Johnson and Johnson did. Yeah, really bad. Yeah. So who are we going after? <laughs> Which company? <laughs> well, Purdue Pharmaceuticals already is, is already in bankruptcy, so I don't know. They may be weak at this point. <laughs> oh no, no that's, we got to find somebody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Austin Pennington, uh, attorney here in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, if they, uh, if you need an attorney, Austin Pennington, where, where, where's your shingle at here in Dallas? How do people get a hold of you? <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're at Walnut Hill in 75. Uh, best way to find out more information about our firm, follow us on Instagram. I'm the Dallas Lawyer on there. We pump out a lot of nice. information. A lot of the different stories we're covering are, are pushed out on there. On Twitter, we're the Dallas Law. And then we've got a, a really good blog collection at pfdallas.com. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate it very much, man. Hey, Thanks for your time. Hey, glad to be here. Looking forward to being on again. Yeah, man.